I want to talk about some new um, research directions in paleontology, um, which I think will connect our subject with wider studies in evolution and allow us to address some important questions, important scientific questions. Of course, much of the way we think about evolution is focused on phylogenetic trees. Um, here we have the very famous, one of the very first uh, evolutionary trees, of course, very famous image from Charles Darwin uh, in his notebooks. And on the right, uh, a more recent kind of tree of, of the kind that, that are becoming more and more common. And this provides, and I'll talk more about methods towards the end, the, the, the ability to um, generate trees, <coughs> whether we use molecular data or morphological data, whether they are concerned with living taxa or extinct taxa, um, gives us uh, a great deal of opportunity to explore evolution. I want to though start briefly to talk a little bit about biodiversity, and then I will connect that with trees and some of the uh, new methods in macroevolution to try to uh, highlight some of the questions that, that we, can, we can consider. So when we think about modern biodiversity, sometimes we may represent the uh, information like this, which is a, a, a pie chart, which is trying to show the relative importance of different groups. That's very familiar. And, um, this reminds us of, the import, of, of, of how unimportant vertebrates are and how very important insects are, for example. And one of the concerns of modern uh, uh, conservation biology, uh, evolutionary biology, <clears throat> is to determine how many uh, living species there are on the earth today. The reason that I'm going to talk about this topic for five minutes is there are two reasons. One, of course, this is a question that uh, anybody might ask, a five-year-old child, a member of the public, anybody might ask, and we should be able to answer. And that's the second reason that, of course, it's useful as a paleontologist to remember that our knowledge of modern biology is not always perfect. Sometimes paleontologists are um, reprimanded, they're told off because their data are poor. But indeed, there are many difficult questions with modern data. So, how many species? Maybe something like 1.8 million species of plants and animals have been formally named. One estimate is that something like 400,000 of those may be synonyms. These are renamed species given a second name. Does that mean that something like 1.4 million named species are valid or correct? But the question then is how many more? We could carry on naming species for a long time and when would we finish the task? Are there still 5 million to name or another 100 million? Difficult to say. So I'll just present very briefly three ways that people try to estimate from current knowledge what modern biodiversity is. So the collector curve is one um, idea which is based upon uh, an understanding of our rate of work. So the assumption here is if we can understand the rate of discovery of new species in human effort, maybe we can then predict ahead into the future where we may go. The trouble is this is all right if we're dealing with birds and mammals because the rate of naming, this would be like 1750, this would be maybe 1900, this is 2013. So at the moment, we are only naming a small number of new species of birds and mammals, so we're maybe near the asymptote and can predict ahead what the final total would be. Something like 10,000 species of birds, eventually maybe 12,000, something like that. Insects, though, are being discovered at a crazy rate, and there is no limit, it seems, on the rate of discovery of new species. So we have no idea, uh, ultimately, how many species of insects there may be. And this matters because insects are much more species-rich than birds and mammals. So 
the collector curve is a neat idea, um, and it can work in certain particular cases, but at the moment cannot work on this question. A second approach was to say we will never be able to estimate total biodiversity of the whole world in one study. So let's simply focus on a small sector of biodiversity and try to make as accurate and complete an estimate as we possibly can. And then having done that, scale up to the whole world. So this is what Terry Irwin did, a, 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 an entomologist in 1980 in a very famous study. He was an expert in beetles. He decided he would focus on tropical trees. He would count the number of species on one species of tropical tree and then try to extrapolate from that. And so the, the figures are there. He picked up hundreds of beetles. He identified that as many as 160 were unique or endemic to that particular species of tree. And this was only beetles. So he went from 160 beetles up to maybe 600 arthropods, insects, spiders, mites, centipedes. We know for a fact that there are 50,000 species of tropical trees. And so this is where he calculated total global diversity of 30 million. Very simple calculation. However, the 50,000 seems to be accurate, but the 600 was the figure that people looked at more closely. This was the estimate that was made a number of years ago, 50 or 100 million species on the Earth. That figure has been quoted quite a lot. But Novotny and colleagues have criticized that um, and suggested that his figure of 160 and 600 were uh, exaggerated. And so they bring the final total down to 10 or 15 million species on the Earth today. The final approach was to say, we'll never count all the species, but perhaps we can count the numbers of phyla, classes, orders, or something like that. And in this study by Mora and colleagues in 2011, they tried to do that. We have some more confidence that those figures are more complete uh, at these higher levels than at the level of species. But then by looking at the shapes of the different curves and modeling the relationship between phylum and, and class and class and order, order and family, they worked out a way to try to predict. And they came to the figure of 8.79 million. Who knows? So there we are. That's, that's a little bit about modern biodiversity just as, as a background. But bringing the two together, we would like to understand some answers about the origins of all of this biodiversity today. This is a question that paleontologists can try to answer. And of course, one of the key parts of this is the tree. But within the shape of the tree, each branch has a different modern biodiversity. So birds are very diverse, 10,000 species. Their sister group, crocodiles, are not very diverse, 25 species. So the branches have the same history, but the end point is very different. And so that's a nice example to keep in mind, crocodiles versus birds. Why the difference? And I think that's the kind of question that we can try to, to, to answer. So just now a brief history of um, some key uh, thinking about macroevolution. Macroevolution meaning uh, evolution above the species level, deep time evolution. We sometimes forget that Charles Darwin said many things uh, in, in his Origin of Species. Of course, he presented uh, most famously the model of microevolution by natural selection. That's the most famous contribution. But the other part of the title, and very substantial in the book, is what he called descent with modification. And that's what we would call uh, splitting or, or origin of biodiversity or macroevolution, something like that. And people had many ideas, many of them now we would regard as crazy. But I guess the beginning of modern thinking, really, is Simpson, famous book in 1944. 
And he was the person who tried to describe what everybody sort of understood, but hadn't put it into an exact form. So he talked about adaptive radiations and key adaptations. This is one of his diagrams, which is supposed to show uh, the origin of a new group, like birds. <coughs> the ancestors are here. These are different ecological opportunities. And the group perhaps radiates, he uses the term explosive, meaning very rapid evolution. And then different branches of that group, whatever it is, mammals or birds or angiosperms, then will occupy various new uh, adaptive zones. And so he introduced a lot of these terms that, that are fairly commonplace. But he didn't, and, and he also was trying to think in a numerical manner. So he was trying to get paleontologists to begin to use statistics and things like that. But he didn't have a way of, of turning his ideas into um, a real kind of calculation. Because at that time, the evolutionary trees were, were quite uncertain. And, and I think things have changed quite a lot. Continuing the history briefly, another important contributor was Norman Newell, who in the 1950s was really the first paleontologist to take mass extinctions seriously. And before his time, and even after his time, people would often treat mass extinctions as a kind of childish joke or something that wasn't a, a serious uh, aspect of evolution. And his work was then taken forward by Jim Valentine, who is still alive, and he published one of the first um, paleodiversity diagrams to try and show paleontological evidence for the change in diversity through time. So this is not in any way related to trees. This is simply adding numbers of species through time, in, in, through geological time in some way. And Valentine was part of the beginnings of what, has, what is now sometimes called the paleobiological revolution, which is normally uh, associated with uh, people in Chicago in the 1970s through 1990s. There are the names of some of the key contributors. And they addressed a lot of different topics. And, and of course, if we think of some of the uh, classic uh, papers written by people like Steve Gould and others, they took paleontology to a much wider audience. And, and certainly the books of Steve Gould have been translated into many languages. Um, and, and all of these people had many bright ideas, many smart ideas that have affected the way we think about evolution. Punctuated equilibrium, I guess, was one of the big concepts that people still, uh, that still inspires a great deal of, of thought and, and work.